Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Millie. I am the moderator for this panel um, called, I forget what the title, The Politics of Portraits. Um, before we begin, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that we are gathered on colonized indigenous land. Um, the Museum of the Moving Image is located on a traditional territory of um, the Lenape people, and that we respect the continued connections with the past, the present, and the future in our ongoing relationship with um, indigenous and other peoples on um, Turtle Island. So um, I'm gonna, just going to quickly go through and introduce our panelists. We have Aishinaro Beneveto, who's going to be pre um, presenting Capturing Their Aspirations, Examining Parents' Photographs of Their Children on Social Media. Um, Emily Steinkamp, looking at looking back at the selfie, a survey of Western self-portraiture from antiquity to selfish, um, the Kim Kardashian book, um, and Rachel Coldicutt, who's going to be presenting the woman's gaze and the robot's gaze. And so we'll just kick it off with Aishinar. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you for the intro introduction, Millie. I'm very excited about this talk today because it's my first time talking to non-academics about this topic, so I welcome any questions or feedback. Um, the title is Capturing Their Aspirations, Examining Parents' Photographs of Their Children on Social Media. And um, this is a, a bigger pro um, the presentation today is part of the bigger project, so there will be some missing pieces. But I'm hoping to um, uh, answer if you have further questions about, because I cannot in, um, present everything in 15 minutes. Um, so this, I mean, the, we're theorizing the web here, right? So we need to spend a couple of minutes on the theory where the study is situated. So I'm using the cultural, um, social cultural uh, theory, but mainly, um, developed by Vygotsky in the 60s, but was then taken over by many, many um, developmental psychologists. And the idea is that the cu culture is the means by which societies preserve and um, preserve their values and meanings. And we act upon these cultures uh, using media tools. So humans don't act upon world without any mediation of any tool. So we use either language, we use words, we use sentences, or we use photographs um, to create meanings, and we change the, those meanings inter, um, dynamically throughout the world. So this study is going to be stopping all these different pieces in one point in time, and then taken a snapshot of what's happening in social media. But before the social media entered our world, we did not just not take photographs. We took photographs of children. Parents took their children's photographs. This is not a new phenomenon. And I want everyone to remember this part uh, throughout the presentation because, again, we are um, using digital tools, social media, hashtags. These are the new uh, cultural tools that we live by, but these are not just inventions that just appeared all of a sudden. And the people who are using these cultural tools, which are the photographs and texts, to make sense of their parenthood, uh, are going through a challenging time, especially for women. Uh, Becoming a parent is developmentally a daunting task. And most of the time, women and parents go um, towards their peers to get support. And digital media or social media can provide um, a, an easiness to build these connections and build a community to get help. Sorry, I don't know what's happening there. Um, so how does that happen? Parents post a lot of photos of their children on social media. I'm pretty sure that many of you are here today in this talk right now because you're realizing that, oh yeah, my friends and my um, cousins are posting their children's photographs all the time, and I'm curious about this. So yes, you're not the only one that's, that's happening. So everyone is 
taking their photo, uh, children's photographs and posting it online. Not necessarily in a bad way, but the question needs to be asked, how is that happening? Before why and um, what children think. So I picked two hashtag cultures and I'm gonna refer them as hashtag cultures because as I said before, culture is something that we want to preserve and promote, right? We, we need to promote those meanings. So uh, these two cultures are going to be gravitating towards each other and also they're going to be qualitatively distinct but also similar to each other, just like any culture. So, uh, for example, there's a childhood culture, I mean, there's a war childhood, there's a, a childhood educational setting, childhood and health settings. So these are different cultures that are related to ch childhood. The way that we define childhood is different because we, we need to be mindful about the context that we're talking about. So these, these are just two examples, just to give you an idea what they, um, may look like at first sight, and then I'm gonna zoom in and offer you a way to study this culture and also what's happening in these. So uh, these are also simple captions. Again, I use Instagram, I don't know if I mentioned, but I use Instagram to gather these um, verbal and visual narratives. Um, this fashion kid's caption says, guess who just woke up from their nap? This drilling baby with messy hair, LOL. Let the kids, we took the littles to a farm today to let them run wild in a corn maze, pet some goats, and so my mama could capture some family photos. Featuring Josh and daddy doll form, can't wait to upload these beauties and share some more. This is again to give you an idea. We're already trying, uh, formulating some research questions in our mind, hopefully. And one of the research questions I asked was how the two digital cultures of childhood postings manifest themselves. First, I'm not gonna go into detail, but finding these two hashtag cultures what requires some process. And I've went through many, many different ones, and I picked these for various reasons. And to understand these digital contexts and their purposes, I looked at the captions, and I looked at photographs and the network structures. So I'm gonna move a little fast here. On the day that I started collecting data, which is just 10 days, there were close to five million fashion kids post and close to one million let the kids post. They're not in equal um, numbers. Fashion kids seems to be a little bit more popular. But over time, in one year, I actually saw that let the kids has grown at a much faster pace than the fashion kids. It's not like fashion kids stop growing, it grow, but it seems like these days let the kids is becoming more popular. So that, all of these are going to get together at the end. In this 10-day period that I collected data, again, there were more Fashion Kids photos, but interestingly, there were more uh, photos with geotags with the Letter Kids. Maybe they wanted to identify and um, emphasize the place. We will see. So. Um, what happened with those geotags? This is just to give you an idea to see how um, we want, if we want to compare cultures, we want to make sure that they're kind of comparable, right? So I wanted to control that. And I see that both fashion kids and let the kids are picked up by users overall globally. However, there are some differences. For example, fashion kids are used the fir first four countries that are mainly popular, Russia, um, Brazil, Indonesia, and uh, I'm going blank here. Um, I can't remember, but these three first. And for the Letta kids is United States, Canada, United Kingdom. So already you're just seeing some sort of an inequality there too. Uh, keep that in mind as well. Let the kids also seem to get more likes and comments. So, 
Then I looked at captions and the networks. So after lots of data cleaning and lots of um, dealing with politics of Instagram, which I'm happy to talk about in another talk, uh, it's because it's hard to gather data from Instagram these days. That's why one of the uh, platforms where um, lo not lots of social uh, research is not happening in Instagram is because of the politics, but we can discuss those later. I first looked at the most accompanied hashtags to get an idea of what are the main topics that are being visited. And as you can see, there are already some themes are emerging there, but um, like emphasis on the mom's use and childhood, but outfit and fashion and the fashion kids. And then I looked at uh, what's, um, what are the specific words that are, hap uh, that are appearing in the captions. And I, some, some, some people use sentiment analysis. I use significance analysis because I'm a narrative researcher. And here, we will see that fashion kids user are more, users are more using more appearance-related words, gender state expressions like diva, girl, babe, and socializers like good morning, hi, hello, how are you doing? So these are some of the examples. Gal, we're lot loving as positive feeling. What have you got engaging with the audience? And then we see, very interestingly, some other patterns, but to me, the most interesting is um, let the kids users are distancing themselves from the child, but also identifying some sort of a possession. So how that does happen? I love watching these to just do about anything. So these two, meaning like these two, not my babies. But then some other caption also says like, my boys think mummies don't drive. Like our home, our family, my boys. So there was all these uh, conflicting um, complex use of uh, evaluative words that are happening in these captions. So which indicates that there are more um, the people, parents who are posting photos with let the kids seem to be more in invested in the network, which I also looked. Fa fashion kids users are mentioning each other more than let the kids users, which could indicate, well, maybe they're using brands and other people when they're posting photos of their children. Let the kids use their incomplete contrast are replying to each other. So they are on their phone more frequently than fashion kids people. So they're more in invested in actually spending time and commenting people and maybe building community. So photographs, what's happening in the photographs quickly. I um, look at some demographics. Most of the kids are white female, toddler, and child, that age difference is not very distinguishable. And then I look at, at some values, which I call values, because in photographs, in our language, we, we have norms and beliefs that we live by, and in our ways of expression, either visually or verbally, we use, um, we emphasize those values. So by having certain things in photographs, I hypothesize that parents are also emphasizing their values and promoting their values. So we see a lot of kids outdoor and in structured activity, which I call posing and educational setting, and they're mostly appearing alone. So let's look at some examples. In the Let the Kids photos, play emerge as a big um, activity. In the Let the Kids photos, there are more domestic spaces around, like a bedroom or a kitchen. So they're not really let, just so you know. But also sometimes, sometimes they're also let be free. So there, again, seems to be these uh, uh, mixed messages happening in the Let the Kids post. And 
The face is usually visible, which also has some indications. So kid's face are can be developmentally tracked over time in the future, maybe. So let the kids are usually taken for being photographed from behind, maybe to promote the candid childhood. And they are appearing naked, naked or semi-naked pretty frequently in arms with pets or animals. So um, there's this other thing that I want to mention that fashion kids are mostly childified and adultified that I call like they are through the use of clothing. They are um, either super like looking super young or like very, very old. Okay, so summary and concluding. It seems like these two hashtags appear to be different cultures. And if there are two different cultures, there may be many, many different childhoods. So the way that you may, you define childhood may be one, but most of the time we, we see in digital media and out in the world, there are multiple childhoods. And that is intriguing for researchers because this is just giving us a way of study them, these cultures. But yeah, childhood is not one thing. There are many, many different ways. And implication of this is another talk and another research that needs to be uh, yeah, presented in another conference, probably. Thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon. My name is Emily Steinkamp. Uh, I'm presenting. Uh, some work that I did uh, about the history of self-portraiture in the West. Um, what kind of motivated this research for me uh, is the cultural figure of the selfie and sort of the way in which um, the selfie seems to be, seems to generate a, a little bit of a moral panic around it um, in, in the way that it sort of consolidates an accusation of like a technologically mediated generational narcissism among uh, millennials. And so what I really wanted to think about was how have people um, represented and imaged themselves in the past? And how can we contextualize the contemporary practice of selfie taking and making um, sort of in a larger history? So this is going to be a very, very much a survey in this history. I can't you know, get into quite everything. But so in antiquity, um, one of the first images that we know to be a self-portrait is this uh, relief of the sculptor Bach ancient Egyptian sculptor who he's depicted here with his wife, but in the same sort of piece, he's also depicted with the pharaoh um, that he worked for, whose name I have forgotten, and his father, who was also a sculptor. Um, and sort of what's important about this example uh, is the close association between self-portraiture and um, political and sort of religious power uh, from a very early point. Um, and then this, my second example from antiquity has to do with sort of a, an apocryphal myth about the sculptor Phidias, who was, um, he's known for sculpting the Colossus at Rhodes of Zeus, um, one of the great wonders of the ancient world. Um, he also worked on this devotional statue of Athena, which was gigantic, oops, and um, he's said to have been imprisoned for including a portrait of himself and a portrait of Pericles, the, the statesman, um, on a shield that, it, that accompanied Athena and this gigantic sculptor. Um, so he's said to have been jailed, right, for this, um, this practice of erect, or of um, sort of representing himself. Uh, and so sort of from a really, really early point, we can see that there's some cultural anxiety around um, representing the self. Um, and so, you know, jumping forward about a thousand years uh, in the Renaissance, in the Western Renaissance, um, the examples of self-portraiture that we can find are from medieval manuscripts. Uh, which were sort of copied by monks and nuns uh, in the early precursors to universities. And in these self-portraits, um, the way that we can tell that um, they are self-portraits is that their names written above uh, the heads. You can see, I don't know if you can see, but this says Rufalus. Um, and over here, this says Dunstan. Um, and so what's happening in these self-portraits is that um, the scribes are depicting themselves at work on the manuscripts, uh, or in uh, St. Dunstan's case, he's depicting himself literally prostrate before Christ. So um, sort of 
the the representation of the self then has to be sort of bound up in this um, performative piety, basically, um, sort of to defend against any charges that uh, the representation of the self is excessive or blasphemous, as we saw with Phidias and Pericles. Um, and there was also uh, sort of a saying from Plotinus in the third century, who's uh, a historian who writes about art, and he said that um, artists need to work on their souls in the way that they work on their art. So there's sort of this way in which artists are afforded um, the cultural space to uh, explore themselves, but even in so doing, it's very important to stay sort of within the acceptable bounds of self-representation um, so as not to literally be accused of uh, blasphemy or sort of of excessive um, self-relation uh, or self-representation. So jumping forward another several hundred years, oh, you don't get my, you don't get all the captions. Well, uh, so in the Renaissance, the self-portrait uh, exploded. And so the Renaissance obviously uh, accompanied a lot of uh, cultural and social and economic changes in the West. You have sort of the accruing of capital in um, port cities, uh, which in turn um, funded and sort of allowed the court culture of um, commissioning portraits to flourish. Um, and so portraits during this period of, were typically of royals, of um, you know regents, and these were the people who were funding uh, the portraits themselves. And oh, I'm sorry. Use this one. Thank you. It would be a little louder. Great. Uh, so uh, portraits. Oh, so there's sort of a, a culture of portraiture that is uh, coming about during this period, and there's also sort of a consolidation of the status of the artist that's happening. Um, painting in the medieval period uh, and sort of before had been considered a mechanical art. Um, painting during this period is sort of elevated to the status of a liberal art, um, no longer merely sort of the work of the hands, but the work of the intellect um, is sort of something that's happening and sort of uh, driving the impetus for um, artists to represent themselves and to uh, explore their own images in portraiture, right? Um, art is being sort of elevated and painting is being elevated. Um, and so one of the really significant sort of developments during the Renaissance and during the early modern period is that Rembrandt becomes one of the very first artists who is ever known uh, by face during, uh, his, during his own life. So Rembrandt painted so many portraits of himself that people knew what he looked like who didn't know him immediately, which was not you know, technologically uh, a thing uh, really before this period. And so with Rembrandt, we, you can really see um, sort of the use of painting the self to elevate the status of the artist, right? Um, and to sort of further his own career. Uh, and I think that is uh, extremely significant in this history. Also sort of simultaneously what's happening in the art world is that um, art academies are being established uh, sort of in the early modern period uh, in Paris in 1648, in London in 1768. Um, art, you know, painting is, uh, there are sort of professors of painting who are being appointed. There's, you know, art is sort of being consolidated, visual art, um, as an elevated sort of uh, practice and form. So in early modernity, there's sort of an increased interest in, there's sort of a more self-aware image that sort of that emerges in self-portraiture during this period. Um, and there's more interest in depicting the artist at work. So we see um, a self-portrait of someone painting. Uh, and, you know, with this Vermeer painting as well, and there are lots of examples of this during this period. Um, Las Meninas is another great one by Velasquez. Um, and so there's really, uh, there's sort of an increased reflexivity that's coming into these portraits and uh, about sort of the process of making art. And um, there's an, an increased interest from patrons in like what it means to make art. And so that kind of gives people the space to um, experiment with self-portraiture and to depict themselves in, um, at work on art. So obviously the next sort of great leap forward in self-portraiture uh, in Western history has to do with photography and the invention of um, sort of early photographic processes in the late 1830s and 1840. This is the very first photographic self-portrait taken by Robert Cornelius. Um, Hippolyte Bayard made this bizarre self-portrait as a drowned man 
uh, because he developed a similar technology to Daguerre of the Daguerreotype um, but didn't sort of get it to the public in time, so he made this portrait of himself uh, sort of drowned in response to you know, his uh, frustrated efforts to uh, introduce various photographic technologies. And the way that pho photography was received in the art world during this period is that it was regarded with a lot of suspicion um, and sort of an, an attitude that photography is insufficiently intellectual, really, to be... Uh, a fine art. At the same time, uh, photographs changed the way that self-portraits could be painted and made. So uh, we have this Lafarge painting that was painted from a photograph, uh, and early photographic processes, um, this, this Edward Steichen self-portrait, uh, was manipulated sort of while it was developing with a brush. So there are ways in which um, photography and painting sort of influenced each other and literally uh, sort of mutually constituted each other during this period. Freed from the sort of burden of literal representation in the 20th century, painting becomes more fantastic, um, more abstract, less literal, uh, more fantastic. Um, and the self sort of becomes an increased, uh, or an area with increased interest, of increased interest for artists, particularly as forces like urbanization and um, industrialization are really changing the experience of the individual in the 20th century. Um, modernism is sort of, you know, rejecting artistic conventions, um, but artists are still able to sort of explore these issues through uh, self-representations during this period. Um, and also in the 20th century, we see uh, sort of the further development of photographic self-portraits, as with Claude Cahoon, sort of uh, exploring multiple identities in um, her, her work, Nan Golden, taking extremely sort of personal and candid photos of herself and her friends. Um, but one of the really amazing sort of ways that photography is interacting with fine art during this period is that once photographs of Jackson Pollock in the top there um, are sort of used to bring interest into the way that he makes his paintings, this is sort of cited as the moment uh, that the performative turn starts to take hold in the 20th century. Um, and people become more interested in the process of sort of doing and performing art, and literally of performance art, um, as sort of another valid way of understanding uh, fine art. And sort of with that, and I don't have any photos of performance artists, but the performative turn has a lot to do with using the body as a medium, um, as with people like Chris Burden or Marina Abramovic or just any of the sort of mid-century um, performance artists who uh, sort of turn away from the canvas and turn their bodies into sort of the object of art and the, the literal material to be modified in fine art. And so where this brings us by the end of the 20th century um, is sort of means of representing the self have become uh, vastly democratized, particularly by sort of the very early 21st century. Um, and at the same time, the selfie and the act of taking a selfie um, <coughs> is sort of, it's associated, so I have this example of this Time cover story from uh, 2013, written by Joel Stein, that's sort of, you know, he's decrying millennials, but in the end, he's like, no, they're fine. Um, but, <laughs> uh, you know, in this article, and in most articles that are sort of uh, uh, anxious about young people and their represent, the way that they represent themselves and relate to themselves, you can't avoid a discussion of um, Kim Kardashian, whose selfie book, Selfish, comes out on Rizzoli, um, an art imprint um, in 2014. And so, basically, Stein in this article says, Kardashian, Kim Kardashian readily admits to having no particular talent. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that by this, t this period um, in history, Kim Kardashian sort of represents a way in which the art-life distinction is being broken down by the rapid proliferation of images um, and sort of the rapid or the wide access to producing images um, among the population. And one of the things that I thought was really fascinating um, was that I sort of looked in, or I was reminded of this piece by Alan Caprow, who was a performance artist in the mid-century, and he writes about art as, let's see, any activity that... <laughs> Um, art is a weaving of meaning-making activity with all or part of our lives. And so he sort of is wants to think about um, life like art, art that is like life. And what I really um, sort of ended up seeing through history is that 
various sort of social structures have worked to make sure that those who are able to make self images are sort of cordoned off from the rest of the social world um, and sort of protected by, you know, the elevated status of the artist or their literal monks sort of depicting themselves prostrate. Um, but that distinction is breaking down. And I think that that has a lot to do with the way in which selfies are sort of something that makes us anxious. So thank you. Okay, hi. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, women looking at um, the women and the robots um, looking at women. And really about how the advent of the camera phone has, for the first time, kind of really uh, following on from Emily, kind of opened up who is able... Oh, okay. Uh, Hi. No, you can't hear me at all now. Yes? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Okay. How, how, uh, how it's opened up. Who is able to take the photos who is a, and who is a, able to publish those? And I'm going to talk specifically about like, the, the fashion internet. Right? And then, the, the fashion internet isn't cool. It's um, mainstream. It's women. It's kind of loads of non-academic everyday things and what's kind of interesting about it is it's an area that lots of men in particular aren't aware of it's a, 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 a thing they never look at which means it never really comes up in debate about um, the way technology is changing the world it's you know it's it's a, a thing that isn't seen and isn't given uh, credit Ability. And I guess one of the reasons no one really looks at it or thinks about it is because it's about women wearing clothes. And, you know, there's a lot of history of men not being very interested in women in clothes. So it's kind of a whole, whole other thing. Um, and uh, in the... It, John Berger here, um, who is was an art, an art historian. Um, in his uh, documentary, um, Ways of, of Seeing, he, he had a whole episode about um, women in portraits. And he really situates them as a sight for men. Um, so they're only really existing until probably the 1900s in a very the side of space. And then gaze is just a conduit, you know. So the woman here in this um, manic picture is looking at the man who is looking at her. He is, and she's only there to channel desire. Whereas kind of on Instagram, if there's, there's a new thing happening where women are creating a site for women. And then they're doing kind of two pretty normal things. Um, they're wearing makeup, and there's like a huge similarity between filtering and face tuning and makeup. And then shopping. Um, and these are just really basic, normal, everyday things that no one is terribly interested in. You know, and um, potentially, this hasn't happened as a kind, kind of act in the site of empowerment. However, in the context of the fashion generally, it's really empowering because the fashion gaze is a man's gaze. Um, it's, you know, and women are only interested as kind of conduits to the power and money in kind of uh, high-end ads and editorial. The women are hardly there and the skin and a bone and they don't have heads. All kind of amazingly, they're drawings. And so this was an ad campaign that um, Louis Vuitton did in 2015. And rather than choosing any of the millions of women in, in the world who are alive, they chose a drawing, <laughs> right? And so the, the, the status of women is, is kind of not really clear. 
And there's a real disconnect between how fashion likes to look at us and how women um, um, think of, of, of um, themselves. This picture here, I love, like loads. I think it's amazing. <laughs> because, um, so this was at the opening of the Met Gala Ball last year. Pharrell looks kind of okay. His wife looks incredible. Like, like this, yeah? You know, and, and you never see a woman in armor. Right? This is an incredibly powerful and strong image. Uh, and it's appropriate because the ball was in honor of Nure Kawakubu, whose clothes are all kind of empowering um, um, and, and um, kind of hard to get into. And then it was really tragic because actually the standout image that was syndicated everywhere with this one, which is, um, you know, Bella Hadid, practically um, naked. Um, the designer had stitched her into the clothes. They're kind of like a corset or a chastity belt. And the original sketch, right, there are so many things about this, I think, that are extraordinary, that show how the fashion looks at the women. If you firstly look at her legs, which are meant to hold up her body, right? That <laughs> isn't happening. But then there's two kind of, like, if you look, there's like a shape there and there, and it's really phallic. It's kind of, it's like invading her space, um, which is really like the kind of very traditional um, passive image of women. And in that context, there's actually something about the everyday Instagram that is really empowering, right? Um, that <clears throat> there's, there's kind of a little bit more authenticity here. Like, it's a little bit more normal than every day. Only slightly, but, you know, it's, 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 it's a different kind of gaze. And, and the a big... The difference here is that there are lots of other women who are intimately <laughs> relating to these people. So there are millions of women who are um, living their lives vicariously through um, in, um, Instagrammers and, inf and influencers and commenting on their images. And it's all like the... The thing that is then quite strange about it is, I think the people who are influencing are attempting to be authentic because they feel that being authentic is going to be more likable. But it's a very special kind of authentic. Like it's it's not really like the humdrum boringness of of everyone's life. It's like slightly better. And the a thing that potentially, I think, wasn't anticipated is that the Instagrammers have become incredibly powerful. The top 10 influencers on Instagram reached a country, like an, an audience equ equivalent to Canada last year. And they're, they're driving a huge amount of retail. Um, and it's like the distance the pictures are from. It's kind of like it's it's arm's length, right? It's the, the selfie stick um, distance. It's not quite close enough, um, up enough to be real, but it isn't distant enough in a way to be unrelatable. And I guess there's a thing in this that seems interesting to me, that like in the context of I me mean, too, it feels appropriate that women are creating their own space to be um, looking at each other. Um, that there's a safety there, that there's a kind of, it, of insularity. And that um, this here is a poster from the musical that was about two uh, giants of 
cosmetics. Um, but the thing that's interesting is for years and years and years, makeup has been known as wall paint, right? It's the a thing that y- you put on to go out and face the world. Um, and that it isn't kind of real. It isn't um, natural. It's... it's um, it's about um, projecting a vision of you at a selfie stick, a distance. And there's a very odd thing that's happening now, which is that um, y- you're able to get um, makeup products that mimic filters, right? And in the UK last year, I think there's 10% less women having procedures uh, on the face because then the filtering in instead, which like that's quite weird because it means that they're actually living their lives on the screen as opposed to in real life, and it isn't really clear is the image they have of themselves more important to how they actually appear. And that actually, it's kind of, it makes loads of of sense that people are like putting on makeup to be on the internet because they're doing it elsewhere. And there's a, I I really like this quote because it points to lots of, lots of things that women do, lots of tiny labors. And so if you've ever looked at someone putting on their makeup, standing up on the train there's loads of things happening there right they um and they're prepared to go through whatever is happening in all in all in order to get to that the so same this all becomes kind of pro- um problematic oh what's happened to my slides i don't know i'll just carry on um while it has to think hang on Oh. Okay, no. <laughs> Can I get to that one? Hang on. Oh, it's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I need to go. Oh, and then I need that. And then can I get back? Da, da, da. This is exciting. Hang on. Yes. Okay. Slash. Okay. Um. So the reason this is important is because, as I just rattle through these slides, um, the problem is is that nobody really understands the data they're leaving behind. You know, so the in, the intimacy we have with our phones um, belies that nobody really un, un, nobody really understands the information they're giving away, and. If if you look at this picture, Beyonce, I mean, it's completely different to the woman in that man in the picture uh, uh, earlier. She's um, looking at us, and she's active, and she's owning it. However, it's still a picture on Instagram, right? And that actually her power is, is, is kind of given away by the fact that ultimately it's the ultimate monetized gays, you know, and e- e- even though she owns this, the 11.2 million likes aren't generating any income for her, you know. Um, and then just quickly, we did a bit of um, research. I run this organization in London, and we were looking at um, what people un- 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 understand about the internet. And nobody understands that the gays are monetized at all. Um, and nobody understands the, the value of the things they're giving away. And this all kind of leads me to end to hours and look, which is where, God, it's like the singularity. Um, so how it works is that you take two pictures using a remote raison camera that is in your bedroom, and it uh, sends those off and 
he rapes them. <clears throat> and I'm really interested because how do I look is like a very context nuanced thing to ask. It could mean anything. It could mean anything at all. It could mean, do I look attractive? Do I look interesting? Do I look fat? Do I look tall, right? It doesn't mean, am I 82% today, right? <laughs> and that the thing that Amazon is generating here, it, 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 it's basically um, checking against the trends and influencers to give you a score. And I think this is problematic for loads of reasons. It's problematic because um, it's um, normalizing. It's problematic because it assumes ev everybody is interested in becoming a, 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 a 100%. And it does this thing where it's taking away our ability to look in, in the mirror, right? We don't have to um, look in, in the mirror or have any sense of self because Amazon is looking at us and it's looking at all of the other women too. I, I, and to end, I think the reason that this is problematic is because, you know, in um, like um, um, Lacan said that, you know, our, our, our image in the mirror is a part of our ego. It's, it's a part of how we understand our, ourselves and form our, ourselves. And if Amazon is taking that on as the job, um, not only does that erode out um, the self and our consciousness, but it means that really the, the woman's gaze is just a, uh, a precursor to the algorithmic gaze. And that's it. Thank you. So thank you. Um, quick shout out to anybody who's live streaming right now. Um, I also want to mention Anya, who couldn't be here today. She was going to present as well, um, but she wasn't able to be here. So um, hi, Anya, if you're watching. Um, and I guess I will ask or kind of put a couple of themes um, maybe to guide our conversation. Then we can take audience questions if there are any. Um, but I want to ask something that is um, I've been interested in this idea of images both as representation and also images as possession. Um, so specifically when we're talking about representations of the self, like an image can be a reflection of that self. But, um, you know, we also construct the self by collecting things and by showing people, you know, who we are through, you know, and especially in like a capitalist system, like our possessions, right? We buy things and we wear things um, that show who we are. Um, and Aishinar, maybe you want to begin with this, um, but one thing that you mentioned in your presentation was like the, um, the captions and how parents will sometimes distance themselves and, you know, in the ways that they're phrasing their captions, their children become possessions. Um, and so I'm wondering if you guys can speak to um, what you think and, and, and maybe kind of elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, sure. Well... I can answer that question from my, based on my research because there's one part of the research that I didn't present today. But I talk to p mothers and children about their opinions about these two cultures, and what I heard from heard from mothers was that they value the photograph as um, artifacts because. Sometimes they say, well, we didn't have enough photographs when we were growing up, so it, it, it is great. I, I want to provide for my child to have a documentation of their development over time. So they appear to be doing favors for their children. And that's not necessarily bad. But at the same time, uh, they also acknowledge that this is not usually how we dress up our children. This is not usually how, like, they, they're they not always nice and looking cute and adorable. We're, I mean, this is just some sort of a reminder to us that, oh, this is, this is sometimes nice. <laughs> you know, it's just like sometimes they look adorable and cute. And um, most of the time, it's such a stressful time that we just... Um, want to maybe emphasize those moments. So they were very candid in their answers. I don't, yeah. 
I, I'm not a parent, so that's one of the... I, I need to distance myself speaking from their angle, but yeah, that's that was their answer, so I don't know if that answers. Yeah. I mean, I can just add to that as a parent, I suppose, um, that actually a lot of parenting is like really boring and sometimes you're just like reaching out for is anybody else out there um and and i think i think you know and it's like it's boring it's dirty it's you know like it, there's lots of love but that i think instagram kind of has another feature too which is like i'm alive Uh, in terms of the relationship between representation and possession, I mean, I think in the history of uh, self-portraiture in the West, um, a lot of what you see is that people who are able to represent themselves are uh, have a certain amount of power and status, um, and portraits, uh, sort of as as a cultural artifact, are you know they're made they're made to be possessed and to sort of um, elaborate political relationships and sort of to represent sovereignty in this way. So. Uh, I think the way in which portraiture has been expanded from something that only the political, the powerful, or the sort of religious elite um, had access to, to something that can actually be sort of a throwaway in a lot of people's day-to-day -day lives, um, is, uh, you know, it's a really significant shift. And I, I think that, you know, part of what I am working on is trying to look at how that shift has manifested in other kinds of, um, like, moments of anxiety in the culture. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to mention to the audience, if there's a moment that you want to jump into the conversation and ask a question that directly relates to um, what the panelists are talking about, please just raise your hand and um, or like call out if I can't see you. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask you um, and kind of pose this to all three panelists is that, you know, images also derive their power from words and from the context in which they're presented. Um, and something that you mentioned, Aishnur, um, and also that you mentioned in uh, the presentation about, um, I think it was uh, medieval um, portraits, where you have a caption and, the, and part of the portrait is deriving its power from um, the caption from naming, like what's happening. Um, and you know, I'm just thinking about what's happening, you know, what I see in a lot of Instagram posts, you know, particularly in Instagram posts where it's like attractive, young, typically white women who are posting selfies, but like being a little bit ironic or like using it as a way to like demonstrate power, even though they belong to a status or class um, of people that has, you know, a fair amount of power. Um, like what does a caption, like how does a caption participate in giving that image its power and also of circulating the image? Mm -hmm. I mean, any, any of you can answer, even though I started with Eichner. Right. Yeah, I, that's a good question because I, analyzing visuals is kind of new to me. I, I, my training is analyzing narratives and textual modes of communication. And we're today we're living in an era where we, our ways, modes of communication is definitely changing, but I'm not convinced that visual is going to take over the text. Um, so yeah, that's a great question that I think that both those expressions, either visual and textual expressions, are going to not always match. Their ambivalence is normal, you know? We're not here as researchers or educated observ observants to identify those ambivalences and conflicts and tell people, hey, your text doesn't really match what you're uh, presenting. Um, and I think it's important to study that, but also um, saying from our angle to, well, it's okay. So let's uh, identify these uh, conflicts and try to understand more of what's happening behind the camera, behind the writing, and um, yeah. I think, <clears throat> I think there's an extent to which <clears throat> um, I think like captioning is one a, a thing, but really the, the function of captions and hashtags are to make things findable and um, readable. Mm -hmm. Like the, the audience, like um, 
um, when people post and then they have like the three lines and then all the hashtags mm -hmm. underneath, right? That isn't the narrative they're offering to the observer. That's that's an al an al an algorithmic um, narrative, and it's like even if you're not seeing these things in me, I'm uh, attributing the, the values, and I th and that's a that's a very different kind of um, narrative power, I, th I think, to the the kind that pe that people have had previously, because the fact that you're able to um, determine how you're found um, is very different to determining how you're um, represented, I think. Um, yeah, well, I think the medieval captions are some of the most interesting ones that I worked with because they sort of directly um, address the fact of the portrait, which you don't necessarily get a lot of in other periods um, of self-portraiture. I guess except the, the ancient ones. But um, what it makes me think about is sort of the way in which medieval self-portrait makers, in terms of these scribes at least, um, had to directly um, sort of counter the fact of the image that they were making by saying, I'm, I'm asking Christ for mercy or you know, I'm, I'm here at work at, on, on this manuscript that you're reading. Um, and then it made it made me think about sort of captions that you see appended to selfies, like typically, um, and how there was this period where you would put a GPOY under your selfie for a gratuitous picture of yourself. <laughs> Does anybody remember? Um, and I guess like a more contemporary version of that is like, I think I look cute in this, might delete later type of thing. These these captions that are like. Uh, used as jokes because <laughs> um, you don't want to really admit maybe to the fact of of your selfie and like uh, of wanting to share your image um, or sort of what that might mean about the way that you relate to yourself or sort of what you want out of the way that the image is going to be circulated or received or sort of projected and um, I think it's just really interesting that there's sort of a parallel in medieval captioning, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, self-conscious irony. Yeah, I actually want to um, plug an article that I recently read uh, in the New Inquiry um, by Arya Dean, um, and it was about the connections or um, the failings of white feminism in um, in like Instagram spaces where like you know pictures of generally attractive white women are like taking pictures of them, of themselves as a way to respond to the male gaze um, without you know like without actually you know without actually doing much. Um, they're still the, you know, accepted paragons of beauty. And so there's like a very much a question of like race there too. Like, you know, who, if, if this is a response to the male gaze and if, if there is some sort of like irony when it's owned, like when it's like, oh, I'm actually not going to make an ironic joke of this. I'm, I'm going to take a gratuitous picture of myself. Um, you know, who, and I think that this was addressed in all panels, like there's definitely a sense of like, there are certain people who are allowed, you know, by status and by class and by race, um, who are allowed to show themselves gratuitously um, without anybody questioning, like, you know, are you being selfish? Are you being, you know, and, and you know, the title, I guess, of Kim Kardashian's book, Selfish, yeah. but like, are you, are you being questioned basically for this representation of yourself? Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting difference on, um, <clears throat> on um, YouTube where, you have people doing tutorials. There's like basically a whole underground um, movement of women doing hair, hair and makeup tutorials. And the difference is like the um, level of entry isn't your attractiveness or the niceness of your house, and or you know it's your knowledge. So it's actually much more. Um, much more um, representative because it's people saying like this is the, the trick they have to do their hair or this is um, expertise that they have and there's a, there there are huge I think quite hidden communities of uh, uh, people who are talking to one another and draw and drawing on each other's expertise but it's less um, performative and more community oriented yeah I, and I, I just want to jump back to the the 
the medieval portraits, like it just makes me think of like, oh, instead of instead of like justifying themselves to their audience, they're like, it's okay, God, like I'm like prostrating myself to you and I'm showing everybody that, you know, instead of like, I, I'm just, you know, this is a devotional portrait rather than gratuitous. Well, and the audience would have been very small right. as well for for an illuminated manuscript is, you know, only the very few people in this culture who could read, um, much less have access to the manuscripts themselves. So uh, God's judgment is more important, perhaps, right. Um, right. In, that, in that period. But I think it's interesting that you bring up um, tutorial communities because I have, I've looked at those before and sort of, you do see a lot of sort of community uh, sharing of knowledge and you can see a different sort of proliferation of um, skills and standards of beauty that are able to be shared. Um, but there's also like in the last even just two or three years been a huge, these channels get monetized really quickly and people like can really rise to the top of those um, sort of worlds. And then you see it reflected back in ad campaigns for brands like Glossier, which sort of explicitly takes the aesthetics of the beauty tutorial and puts it into the makeup ad and sort of the, um, you know, even the finished product is supposed to be like, oh, if you're not good at makeup, you just wear this Glossier stuff, but it's fine. It's not so hard. We showed you how to do it. Or like Sephora runs tutorials now in its, in its stores. Um, so there's a really interesting way in which even sort of the community that can be formed around um, controlling the way you look get sort of taken right back up into the sort of monetizing, uh, I don't know, forces. Yeah, um, I'm actually interested if you can speak a little more to that, because I know you, you ended your presentation with that. Um, but the ways that, you know, essentially what can be superficially assumed to be like, oh, women are reclaiming, or women of a certain status are like reclaiming their space or reclaiming the gaze. And in fact, it's being directly capitalized on, um, or it's, it's, it's following very kind of clear streams of capital. I'm wondering if you can speak a little more to that. Yeah, I mean, the, the a, a thing I suppose that's most con concerning about it <clears throat> is actually the uh, judgment and the normalizing. And so there's an extent to which, um, like, the idea that there are... Uh, Paragons of uh, algorithmic norms that everyone ought to be aspiring to is one kind of problem there, but I think I think the other issue is that it's really feeding into that fast fashion consumerist um, way of, of thinking about things. It isn't encouraging you to go back to your closet. It's not. Um, making you think it doesn't really matter. It's it's kind of <clears throat> making it easier and easier and e and e and easier to shop. And so, I suppose maybe the impact of this would be different if the revenue that was generated would be shared in the communities. But the thing that actually happens is there's a tiny n number of influencers who are making a huge amount of money, um, and they're kind of draw drawing on the labour of the people who who are their fans. Like it's it's actually really complicated as as an economic model, um, and that you know if you're at the the, the top of your your influencing game you can command tens of thousands of dollars for a photo. Um, and the, the way that then that is changing the lives of the people who are taking the photos is then it's kind of like just a, 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 a totally recursive uh, um, nightmare of, uh, of, of, uh, of um, narcissism. Mm -hmm. You know, so, like those two things, the money and the narcissism, are, all, are ultimately really coupled. However, I don't know how long the women as influencers are going to continue to be important because algorithms are like likely to come in and take over. If that well, makes sense. Yeah, I think something really interesting that you mentioned was like. Amazon, Amazon look is not encouraging you to 
go back into your closet. Like it's like you pick two things you've already worn. Um, and that sense of experimentation, like I'm, I know that there's a lot of people who communicate, maybe not on social media, maybe not publicly, but one of the interesting things about like being able to communicate through images is that you can like send people pictures of your outfits, right? Um, and so like that, and that strikes me as like a, you know, a sense of community building. Like there's that exchange and that relational exchange. Um, and so the fact that Amazon look is like both kind of born out of this you know, th these interactions where it is kind of community based or like when you're posting something on Instagram, you're looking for feedback, even though it may be that the, the communication is like not as direct as one person sending an outfit and the other person also sending an image of an outfit. But the fact that like, you know, what ends up happening is you just are, you're talking a to no one, like you're, yeah. you're, ta you're getting, you're getting, it's like feedback from yourself, but also from Amazon look with these like weird percentages. And it like takes away from, the actual like fun part of right. I feel like yeah, getting yeah. dressed and the reason that like a lot of people take these selfies anyway well, and and that the the reason you're doing it is because of the lack of confidence you're doing it because mm. you're saying do I I um, look okay and you're asking for affirmation and it's kind of you know if 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 anything in the world is going to not give you affirmation as as an individual and grow your confidence and grow your sense of um, the self it's probably amazon right you know amazon has an interest in um repeat custom it do, it doesn't have an interest in your sense of the of, of self and i think that is huge hu hugely problematic Mm. Um, I just want to, we have about like eight minutes left, maybe a little less if there are audience questions. Um, I'm going to, well, we want, we want to make sure, we want to make sure that people watching the live stream can hear you. Hello. I feel like this um, focused pretty directly on a relationship wherein um, a deliberate choice was made to put on an outfit knowing it would get posted to social media. And I'm wondering if you guys can comment on the very trendy world of street fashion with the people who sort of put on an outfit hoping it will ultimately get posted to social media. Where are the differences? Where are the similarities in the gaze and in the choice of the person wearing the outfit? Thank you. I mean, there's a... the. The thing that's interesting is, is I think that that's really declining um, because the thing that like if you think maybe like t 10 years ago Bill Cunningham was uh, cycling around and taking the photos and he had a role as an arbiter and a taste maker and the thing that's happened now is the people who were being photographed have, have become um, the arbiters. So I think that's changing. No. <laughs> I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't have any strict fashion ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, yeah, if, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's important to notice these as educate, like have being educated, um, but also it's important to study them in a rigorous, systematic way before we judge. Um, because, I mean, maybe I will be the devil's advocate, but sometimes people, like individuals have their agency and they, they, despite they know the algorithms, despite they know that they need to boost their self-confidence, but sometimes they may still choose to post these photos because as I was saying, that fashion is a culture. It's it's a tool that we all care about what we wear, for one reason or the other. And um, some people may choose to present them. When it comes to adults, it's no problem to me if you ask me developmentally, because adults have their own choices and they can purchase smartphones. I may sound very revolutionary right now. <laughs> But when it comes to children or other marginalized communities, I think that we become a little bit more judgmental and worry too much, have hyper concerns about protection, privacy, and that's okay, that's normal. 
because most of the time when I give speech about my topic, people say, well, yeah, you think that's bad, right? That parents are posting their children's photos. And I say, well, I don't know, because it seems like parents are taking advantage of it. As long as they talk to the child and like explain them what's happening, I don't see a problem. I mean, I saw, I'd show Sally Mann's in, like famous naked photo of her child and she like she has this amazing New York Times piece that she wrote while well, I talked to my children about this and we spoke and we I mean it helped them get educated about publicity and privacy and their rights and I think that what's missing most of the adult conversations that we don't speak about, do you know your privacy rights? Do you know where this photo is going? Do you know like, how this photo may end up in a completely different place? Most of the time, people don't know. But uh, yeah, but, yeah, that's my two cents there. Hi. Um, <clears throat> Thank you so much for, for sharing your papers. This was fascinating just to like see the through line of like projecting aspirations and dismantling male gaze and like how that arose out of this history of re-examining the self. So building on all of that, I'm curious, and this is more like perceptual, I think maybe than things you've re researched. Do you feel like these ad hoc hashtag communities with fashion or parents as aspirational have um, do they encourage evolving, like evolution of fashion and norms and, and representation, or do they tend to be more self-policing, or is it some of both? I'm, I'm curious if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, as I said, they're definitely based on self-interest. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't think that they have any concerns whatsoever about if their children are going to like being represented this way. But if I ask everyone the question, what's your favorite childhood photo? Everyone can think and find one, right? And that very much influence our identities, our uh, behavior, about how we represent ourselves to the world. Um, so there's a self-interest definitely from the angle of parents or person who's doing the posting but I also have to always say, well, every parent have their best mm -hmm. of their children in their heart, right? They don't want to necessarily harm them. So, um, yeah, definitely it seems like a selfish act. But more research needs to be done following up on these children, especially influencer children. They're like children who are making millions of dollars and that's that that is a child labor issue too right so as babies these babies are making money and um they, they're taking advantage in one angle but we don't know what that where, where that money goes to um so yeah there's definitely a need for more research following up on children and parents and how they en end up there's an amazing documentary called The Marina Experiment. Um, this woman who had a photographer uh, father who documented all of her childhood. And she made this 15 minute amazing short film based on these small footages and recordings and how disturbed she was at the end because she, she thought that this was a child abuse. Um, so I highly recommend it. So that's an example that happened in the 80s, but I don't know if in 2020s we will see more documentaries of, of children or adolescents and just telling their parents, like, why did you do this? Like, why did you document all my life? Because I cannot get into college because you posted photos of me doing such and such. Or like there may be transgender that they may not have any interest seeing photos of themselves as like women or like men, you know? So there are so many implications that definitely needs to be researched, yeah. Rachel, I know you wanted to quickly jump in. We're almost out of time, just, but if you want yeah, to respond to that. Like, I think there's the really interesting thing that how long do we have to wait to look back on something to know whether it was good or bad? And I think that's a really urgent 
problem of now that sometimes at the moment I think we maybe have to guess because if we leave it for five years then who knows I think that um, wraps up uh, our panel today so please give a round of applause to our panelists um, and again we missed Anya but um, we hope she'll be back next year so thank you